for people who don't uh, live in payments, uh, we are basically invisible. We make money move. I give banks a lot of credit for what I call small innovations. My, my fear here is, where is the incentive for open banking and open finance going to come for the banks and predominantly the bigger banks who actually control the vast majority of the customers, right? Each bank will have to decide where they want to live in the value chain, right? Some banks, they are comfortable to be the platform bank, which means, you know, I they like that there will be multiple channels which will be bringing banking services to the market. Some other banks, and they have this concept that the banking app will become a super app where you're going to be chatting with your friends. I wish them luck because I don't think that's the model. Um, but uh, imagine that you know you have reached to everybody on Botim or everybody on WhatsApp and you can start marketing uh, your banking products. I want to welcome you to the second season of Couchonomics with Arjun. Join us this season as we go beyond fintech and payments and embark on the journey into the future of financial services, a future which will be shaped by existing and new developments in technology and innovation, including and not limited to the likes of embedded finance, open banking, ESG, various versions of metaverse, decentralized finance, digital currencies, and other trends. On the couch, we're going to have the most influential and progressive-minded founders, executives, investors, regulators, innovators, and industry commentators from across the MENA region and beyond. Join us as we unravel a multitude of layers of the financial services industry and try to learn how technology will continue to impact the world that we live in. Couchonomics with Arjun is proud to collaborate with some of the most respected and innovative names in the world of payments, fintech, and technology. Ardian is a reliable end-to-end -end payment solution that provides innovation and flexibility to help businesses achieve their ambition faster by turning payments into a strategic growth driver. Get everything you need with TuYu, a Saudi-based super app for delivery, mobility, on-demand services, and a lot more. TuYu connects you to everything you need to enrich your daily lives by building an ecosystem across its end consumers, merchants, and reps. Visa is a world leader in digital payments with a mission to connect the world through the most innovative, convenient, reliable, and secure payments network to enable individuals, businesses, and economies to thrive. GDA is a leading fintech and payment solution provider founded in Saudi Arabia, expanding rapidly across the region with established operations in UAE and Egypt. GDA's vision is to empower merchants with the tools to start, manage, and grow their business. M2P pioneers next-gen fintech through innovative offerings across payments, lending, and banking landscapes. Their comprehensive tech stack powers end-to-end -end banking services, BNPL, customized credit cards, prepaid cards, and more. Welcome to today's episode of Couchonomics with Arjun. And I guess I'm tired introducing myself as Arjun. So welcome again. Uh, joining me today uh, is someone who's leading arguably uh, uh, one of the most interesting, uh, I guess, introductions in the world of fintech and payments that we have seen in the UAE. Uh, he goes by the name Jan Pilbar. He is the CEO of Al Etihad Payments, uh, which if I'm not wrong, and I will be corrected shortly, is spun out of the Central Bank of the UAE. Um, so Jan, welcome to the couch. Thank you so much for having me. No, pleasure. Um, and just to confirm you, I downloaded and got myself active on Ani the day the announcement came out. Excellent. Right. Thank you so much. And I, I thank you because I think you've just literally only launched it weeks ago. And, and, you know, you agreed to come on the, on the show. Uh, so appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, hopefully we can spread the word about Ani because I think it's still slowly finding its way into people's, uh, uh, I guess, memory banks and they're learning about it. Awesome. So I'm going to put you right on the spot, <laughs> right? You. Please tell us what Al Etihad Payments is. So we are a national payments utility, of course, for people who don't uh, live in payments, uh, we are 
basically invisible because we are behind the scenes and what we do we make money move so uh, when people withdraw money from an atm when you pay with your debit card at a point of sale for your groceries or something uh, it goes through our system so when you send money uh, using iban and now newly also ani Effectively, we are a subsidiary of Central Bank, as you mentioned, uh, and the Central Bank had an idea to basically take all retail payments activities and put them in a professional company, which is uh, Aletiat Payments. And uh, the first uh, the first outcome of our work is, uh, is Ani. Is Ani, and congratulations on that. But just to kind of extend that view, and I think you know the, the, the viewers will 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 sort of value this is. We we appreciate you came out of the central bank. What was the what was the rationale, right? So why create a, a, in my my words a public payment infrastructure player, right? What was the thinking? And if I could ask, is if you could give us a little bit of what's kind of the mission and the objectives that it's doing because these things were being done in the past too, right? Hundred yeah, percent. Yeah, maybe not by. Uh, Maybe we will do them a little bit better. Uh, but um, so generally, you see around the globe emergence of uh, you call them national payments infrastructures, and there are three models. One is uh, that sometimes the infrastructures are owned commercially. Then you have uh, state-owned or central bank run, and then in between is something I call mutuals or cooperatives. That the participants in the ecosystem they kind of get together and they establish uh, an infrastructure. All of these models have some pros and cons, but basically the outcome, especially on the mutual or the public uh, purpose organization, is to bring more efficiency. Because as the financial institutions mature, you realize that there is actually, or there are a lot of activities the financial institutions don't actually and should not compete on. You know, moving money in a safe way, making sure that there is proper fraud and risk management security, that's something which should be kind of taken care of and the financial institutions, fintechs, banks, everybody else should focus their energy on getting uh, fantastic uh, end user experience to their customers, both businesses and, and no, consumers. Fair enough. And I think we have some success stories and I will come back to that in terms of the comparator. Uh, you mentioned Ani, obviously it's their, it's your poster child uh, launch and I'm sure it's first of many. Uh, in common man's language, right? <laughs> What is instant payments? What is Ani? So uh, thank you for downloading the app, but Ani is much more than an app. So let me start what it is. It's a it's a payments platform or payment scheme. Uh, as geeks, we like to talk about, uh, about schemes, but effectively it's a payments experience. So when you see Ani or the logo, you should know what you expect. I see some logos of other schemes here like Visa. Um, so when you see the logo, you know what's going to happen with Ani. That's the same. That's what we are trying to introduce. So basically, Ani is a way how you can pay uh, in a matter of seconds. And it's coming from your account, uh, being it a bank account, being a wallet, being it uh, any other store of value to another another account. And what's revolutionary is that it really happens in a matter of seconds. So we are enforcing that it either succeeds or failed. So no pending payment, which you wait, you know, mm -hmm. in an awkward uh, situation. And uh, the other aspect is that you don't have to remember these long I bands or exchange this information, which we usually don't know about yep. each other. I know your cell phone. I know usually your email address or your merchant ID. So I should be able to send you money by just knowing that. So yes. much easier way of so your addressing proxy payments. proxy becomes the mobile number. That's the... That's the and, and if I may add, and please correct me, um, you can possibly use Ani in, well, multiple ways. Uh, two, which I, 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 I guess uh, I'm going to quote is one is, you can go into your banking app, right? And you can actually using the mobile number of the person who you want to send money to send the money through your banking app. That's, that, correct. that's one. And the other is you can use the Ani app in conjunction with the QR codes that, that, that you have issued where you can actually make the payment through the Yanni app. Maybe let's unpack it a little Please, bit. And that uh, was, so that there, was the question. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So there are two models. One is uh, something we call person-to-person -person payments. Um, so you are 100% correct. For us, the channel, how we get the payment experience to the end users, to the consumers, uh, doesn't really matter. So, uh, of course, we support uh, banking channels. So when you open your ADCB, ENBD, FAP banking app, you should be able to find Annie there and uh, send money uh, that way. So basically, 
basically the person to person is a relatively easy experience. You said you were able to do it. So you just load uh, your phone book. You see how many people have been enabled to receive uh, money. You click, you key in how much money you want to send and with a proper authentication you send. And that can be done either from the channel of the of the bank or financial institution or through our own app, which you can also download. The benefit of our app is that you can connect to connect it to multiple bank accounts. So if you have multiple bank accounts or if you are a business with multiple bank accounts, you can do payments kind of from one one app. So that's the person to person, which is exciting, innovative, and we like to do it. But for a payments platform to be successful, you need to offer more. Uh, and that's where some of these QR codes uh, come into play, because of course, what we want to enable is Ani to be also accessible when you want to pay for goods and services. So basically point of sale payments, especially for smaller merchants who currently may not be, you know, enabled to accept digital payments, they will be able to just print a static QR code like we saw in some other parts of the world. You walk by, you scan it with your Ani app or your banking app, and you pay the merchant in uh, in real time and you can, you know, okay. uh, take... Uh, so I'm going to, Jan, if, I do, if you don't mind, I'm going to challenge some of that assumption, right? So so I'm, I'm ethnically Indian. Um, uh, I have been fortunate enough to have traveled across China and, and South Asia. Uh, I've actually also uh, been spend time and, and use uh, the, the Latin map in Brazil. The, the common challenge I saw across all of those countries where we saw vast and mass adoption of QR was based on the point that you just met, that the acceptance landscape was not there, right? Uh, uh, you know, thousands and thousands, if not millions of merchants could not accept payments digitally, right? Uh, I'll just use the example of India. You know, you drive through actually vegetable vendors, right? Typically in India tend to have this, you know, fresh food just comes and it's pretty much their whole stock is sold in a day or two. Now you see QR codes with these guys and, you know, you can go download your, you know, Paytms, your Google Pays, your phone pays, whatever it is and, and make the payment, right? Uh, similarly in other markets, when China actually with WeChat and Alipay came around, acceptance wasn't there largely because it was a one scheme country, right? Again, you could argue there were other schemes, but it was largely. Correct me, please, and I, I do want to get corrected here. I have not seen that as a problem in the UAE, uh, digital acceptance. As a matter of fact, I do not know the last time uh, someone said, I cannot accept your card for a payment, right? Some now even Apple Pay. Taxis, to be honest, was funny. They came in pretty late to the story, yes. right? Does that problem really exist here? So, no, uh, I think it's, it depends where you live, right? So UAE has also two economies, right? Very much digital payments enabled, innovative, uh, first world, one of the best payments or fintech experience you can have. Mm -hmm. But uh, we also have a large portion of pop population which is not completely financially included and mm -hmm. they transact in cash. And for them, you know, uh, getting a card sometimes is uh, is a challenge and, and stuff. Uh, so we feel that this can nicely complement some of the gaps in the market. Mm -hmm. um, what you saw in some other regions, you mentioned India. Uh, there is always this debate if uh, instant payments, account to account payments are going to cannibalize the card payments or not. So that's a worry uh, everybody has. Um, you haven't seen it much actually happening in any of the jurisdictions. There are reasons for people to use cards um, and there are reasons for people to use uh, account to account. Mm -hmm. And what we saw in India was a mainly uh, transition of the cash transactions, low ticket, uh, low ticket items into the QR codes, the UPI based, in our case, it would be any based uh, payments because technically they should be cheaper uh, to accept. So you should be able to uh, to also digitalize some micro payments. And so small payments. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and so here's my view, right? And it's a hypothetical view. I personally think the value of lower cost transaction from a merchant perspective, especially the smaller merchants, and the speed of acceptance, right? Speed of payment, mm -hmm. speed of acceptance, right? Is hugely beneficial because these, these businesses are cash run businesses. For them, cash is king, not in terms of the value of cash, but money in the bank, right? And instant payment does something because some, some of these are sitting on T plus two settlement. Right. With you guys, it's seconds, if not minutes, it's done. So I, I see a huge value. And, and, and to be honest with you, I 
couldn't care if there's cannibalization or not. I think there will be some in, in a market like ours. Has to be because people will switch because it's faster, it, it's faster payments. I think at the end of the day, it's the right thing for the environment. I think the other thing which I get quite excited about is if I was to use India and, and, and LATAM as an example, you will see a plethora of fintechs who can then ride on the back of a reliable public infrastructure or national infrastructure and solve some real problems rather than play the arbitrage of national infrastructure inefficiencies, right? I, I, I think I, I'm completely right. So how are Ani, how's Ani different than Pix and UPI or is it just identical? So we just launched, PIX launched a little while ago, uh, and PCI or UPI uh, uh, longer while ago. I think uh, you picked two examples, uh, which are the success stories when it comes to <laughs> when it comes they're, to they're instant the easy payments. Ones to pick so up. of course we got inspired. There are certain things which uh, most uh, most instant payments platforms around the world are. Uh, copying or getting inspired uh, from UPI and PIX. Of course, you cannot uh, use uh, exactly the same principles and try to apply them in uh, other jurisdictions. Yeah, so 9 we, million, 1.5 billion. Yeah, no, it's, it's quite different. Yeah. Uh, so, of course, we did design the platform uh, for UAE. And I think what's different uh, about Ani is the scope of services which we are going live from day one. Um, and also, uh, you mentioned, you know, the idea of... Um, Ani is actually an enabler, right? It's not, a, as I mentioned, it's not an app. Uh, I, it's more enabling and leveling the playing field that fintechs who have wallets, bank accounts, uh, large banks, yeah. uh, exchange houses, they can now all transact in an open uh, open loop environment. So even if you have a WPS card, you should be able to send money from that WPS salary card to a bank account of uh, of your choice. Um, so that's what Ani actually does, enables, similarly to UPI, enables uh, kind of level playing field and more openness of the core clearing and settlement infrastructure in a secure way. Yeah, and, and that, you know, adds a lot of advantages to a lot of the, 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 the fintechs because, to be honest with you, I think a lot of the fintechs started off. And, you know, we saw a proliferation in the middle a few years ago uh, that a number of, you know, so-called P2P apps launched, which were predominantly closed-loop products, the thing. right? And, 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 and the problem with any B2C adoption is that there's only so much money that you and I will send to each other unless you st don't start getting other payment categories like merchants and others taking it on, then, you know, you don't see the volume, you don't see the value, then it's harder to build other products on it. So I do think that this is something the market obviously needed, without doubt, and I think it will unlock a lot of potential. And closed loop systems generally, for that reason, are not able to scale uh, as much. The example you used of WeChat and Alipay is uh, one where it did scale. Right? <laughs> and there's one other very good, but I think there are, so, Yes, I totally agree with you. They can't, but there are some, you know, so uh, Starbucks is a great example of a closed loop system, right? It, Starbucks holds about $180 billion, which is, I think, number five in terms For of- For Apple Pay, it was the largest mobile payments app totally, uh, in, totally, uh, right? in the US. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and I think Venmo with PayPal and Cash App with Square have also sort of achieved that mass scale, but that's because they had the acceptance environment, right? They had the Square, they had the PayPal. And I do think- we should have a future where all of these play a role, right? I think closed loop will have a play a role to play. So will MasterCard and Visa. And I think that leads to my next question, which is how do you see Ani sort of fit into, I wouldn't say, a, a rel, but it is a relatively more mature payment ecosystem compared to the less of, rest of the GCC, right? Uh, UAE has been a little bit sort of ahead of the curve. So how do you see that playing and, and, how do you see the, the reaction from the two big networks, right? What, what has been the initial sort of view? Yeah, so first of all, you, I'm new to UAE. I've been here for six months. I uh, came from South Africa, uh, which surprisingly is also a very advanced uh, payments market. So many, you know, uh, world's first actually came from South Africa. Before I was in Canada, unfortunately, North America, generally the payments are falling behind quite totally. significantly. So, of course, as we, you we move, were swiping uh, cards till a few years ago. Exactly. So, okay. so uh, I was quite impressed uh, with what UAE has in terms of infrastructure. And exactly, I think uh, what uh, what I like is your comment that Ani is not here to compete with anything, right? Closed loops 
will still exist. Uh, when you think about it, a bank is a closed loop, right? Mm -hmm. If uh, there was only one bank and everybody was a customer of that bank, we don't need infrastructures like any. That's not the case. Uh, closed loop can provide services, can do whatever they need to do. At some point, you need to move money out of the loop exactly. or back into the loop. And that's what Ani is, right? So uh, that's that's what we are doing. That's how it's underpinning, uh, underpinning uh, this movement of funds. What it does also differently is um, Ani, yes, move money, but we also have something, uh, and that's probably linking to the open banking, open payments. We also allow um, players to initiate payment without necessarily being in the flow of money. Okay. So, uh, for example, you know, and that's kind of the risk management. Uh, you can have uh, merchant acquirers who uh, just can generate a dynamic QR code and basically request a payment from your account to the merchant accounts without sitting in the flow of money. Okay, so you can so do re you can do request payment pay. initiation, request to pay, and and stuff like that. So we are trying to also, as I mentioned, you know protect what's the core and that's the financial messages where money actually exchanges hands that has to be protected. These institutions are heavily regulated and will continue being heavily regulated. But we are opening it up that uh, there can be other still licensed institutions who can do certain things uh, with uh, a little bit uh, little bit less risk. You mentioned about the schemes. As, uh, as I told you, I still believe that ANI will coexist uh, with, uh, with card payments and everything else. You see that schemes kind of having different strategies strategies when it comes to account to account. So in some aspects, I think they may see us as a competitor, but we are not a commercial entity. We want to do the right thing for UAE. We want people to uh, you know, pay less when it comes for payments, remove friction. So I think they should welcome that competition. Well, I, I think I think there's no harm. I will come to a very interesting question around proliferation of payment formats and form factors and the implication on the consumers. But before I go there, last question regarding Ani. Uh, adoption and scaling. So what's, you know, what are the the mechanisms that you guys are using? Because as you said, you're not a commercial organization. So you're not going to be, well, you tell me if I'm wrong, you're not going to be incentivizing me to to sort of download apps. Maybe you are or download or download usage. So what's, how are you guys planning to scale? So uh, the scaling is important for any network infrastructure, right? It's about economy of scale. Um, so when you see we are live now with uh, just under a dozen financial institutions, the largest banks are live. Uh, so if you have bank accounts or uh, if you are with... Uh, That's how I use with, it. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, so it's important to have something I call a critical mass, right? So uh, people can actually be reached. Um, we still have a long journey to onboard the remaining uh, close to 100 uh, financial institutions or ex all, all exchange houses here. So it's going to be a lot of work over the coming <clears throat> year to really have a completely ubiquitous uh, reach when it comes to when it comes to ANI. Now, um, as I mentioned, we are behind the scenes. So ANI as a product as a scheme is actually launched by the financial institutions. So I don't know who you bank with, but you should probably, you should have received emails. I did and I don't, and I've used it. I've enrolled. Perfect. It, yeah. So, but that's where the marketing is going to actually happen. Uh, so the financial institutions will be marketing it as a new product because they see some commercial benefits in, uh, you know, offering these services to their customers. The second aspect will be, I, you know, the largest uh, merchant acquirers are now coming on board. So uh, the acceptance at the point of sale will be a massive driver for adoption. We have seen it in other parts of the of the world as well. Just to, you know, we launched three weeks ago, not even. Uh, we have over 300,000 people who are enabled already. Uh, and uh, it continues growing every day. So, uh, yeah, I think so it's... So I'm going to ask a question which is quite intriguing. So um, I briefly mentioned it to you before we we, we, we got in. So, so my background uh, uh, is... So I, I actually ran a payments in a fintech company for one of the largest conglomerate across sort of eight countries, right? And and uh, we were we were arguably one of the biggest acquiring accounts to go after, right? Um, and I'm sure that acquirer is knocking on the door of my, I guess, the person who succeeded me in that role because I moved on about three years ago. Here's a question. Please ask, please answer me. It's more of a technical question and maybe it'll bore most of the people. I can, it's my show, so I'll take, I'll ask the question. Is... If I have a closed loop wallet, mm -hmm. right, um, I don't need to be regulated, right? Can I use Ani as the underlying infrastructure and still keep it closed loop? Why would you? 
No, just asking because <laughs> because I don't want to get regulated. Yeah, so no. The the short answer is uh, no, because only if you have the right license, you can be connected to Annie. Right. Of course, the benefit of connecting to Annie is that you become a uh, open loop because you can reach the other participants on on Ani, but I think commercially it wouldn't make too much sense uh, to be connected to Ani because I would charge you for an honest transaction or closed loop oh, transaction, you? Okay. which wouldn't make too much. Uh, there you go. I just wanted to get that out of the way, right? So, so you know, that's the answer question to whoever wanted to ask that question. So, uh, I'm going to request you now, sort of, you know, switch to your practitioner's hat, right? Uh, you, you've had obviously had several years of experience working in this field globally, right? Um, Pick for me a couple of interesting trends, right? And there's so many, which are sort of shaping the, or re-architecting the world of payments, right? I'm a consultant, I have to use big words, right? Uh, uh, some of the technologies which you believe are here to stay and you believe will have sort of a profound impact in terms of you know, what payments will look like in about a decade's time or five years time. So the one thing I know for sure is that I'm going to be wrong, right, with all these predictions, because when you look back over the last 10 years, many things uh, change. change. Um, I have to admit that over the coming or over the past couple of years, things have changed a little bit. And it's probably driven by the geopolitical situation. Because if you asked me before, uh, I was a true believer that cloud uh, is completely changing the game, right? I have been building mission critical payment system for the last 15 years. Okay. And the last one we launched in South Africa, we did on a public cloud. I think it was the first national payments infrastructure which the regulator agreed to put in a in a public cloud. Wow. And uh, it short circuits quite significantly, you know, building a system of that nature because you get, you know, uh, high availability and all of these features mm -hmm. kind of out of the box. Of course, now when you see a reaction of different countries to the different geopolitical situations, you want to be a little bit more close than yeah. in, in control. I still believe that cloud has a big, uh, big future uh, when it comes uh, when it comes to payments. Uh, but uh, I think people are now a little bit careful adopting and becoming uh, locked to a certain, uh, you know, public cloud provider or something like and that. And I think I agree with you, right? Because see, I'll take a slightly different perspective. It's not a different. Perspective. I'll add to that perspective. But tell me if you if you if you agree with my view. And and I'm actually going to. Uh, quote a discussion. So I was at a at an event uh, in Kigali earlier in the year, uh, which was basically the inclusive fintech uh, forum, where, you know, which talks about financial inclusion yeah. and payments is, in my humble opinion, the arrowhead of any financial services shift, right? And And one key takeaway, at least for me, is very simple, right? Payments is, in my humble opinion, the olive oil of data, right? So, you know, if, if, if data is the oil, payments data is olive oil, right? Uh, right? And, and governments, national governments are starting to realize the power of data, right? And especially power of national data in terms of people, citizens, you know, consumers, so on and so forth. And so therefore, it's actually become a national topic, right? Uh, and some can even say it's a national security topic, right? Because with cyber threats and so on and so forth increasing, you know, a lot of these so-called proxy wars now are cyber wars, right? Yep. I can completely see why more and more governments want to go down the national payment, control. The, the national payment infrastructure uh, perspective, have certain level of control, not have everything available to anybody. And wherever there are very strong bilateral relationships, then maybe they'll collaborate either at a technology level or at a data level, right? So I actually see that shift. And I think this is a transition which I don't see stopping. I actually see this as a juggernaut, right? Which it doesn't matter if you have a financial inclusion issue or not. Yeah. You want to be in control. There are certain things you definitely want to be controlled as a yeah. sovereign nation. <clears throat> I think the data that's an interesting topic uh, it was actually a trend which happened a few years back, right? ISO 2022 was a big topic that payments, which was always carrying very little information, now can carry tons of information. And most of the platforms which are being built today are ISO 2022 enabled. ANI is not any different. And people started realizing that with so much data traveling with the payments, you can learn a lot of things. Yes. Uh, and you know, in South Africa, for example, now casting big topic, we could tell how the economy is performing much faster than any statistician, you know, out there. So people realize, okay, now we have more data, perfect for straight through processing. We can bundle invoices with payments. 
Well, you also have to make sure that the payments data is uh, properly guarded and properly secured. So I think that's kind of a trend which continues as a result of ISO 20022. I still feel that the cloud will will go instant, uh, real time. That's a topic which will stay around. People want everything now. You don't want T1, totally T2. Agree. That's, that's something which goes. I have to mention CBDC. Uh, I have to mention, you know, my my past. I was issuing physical notes uh, in one of the European countries. I feel CBDC here is as the next generation of uh, fiat currency, right? We had coins that was that became a little bit heavy to carry around. Uh, we started printing paper. Uh, now we live in metaverse. Uh, at least that's what my son is telling me. No, 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 me. no, we're so, I hope we don't. <laughs> Let's just... So, uh, you know, even the paper money is becoming a little bit limiting. Uh, you know, you, you want to program purpose for money and stuff like that. So, so I'm going to invite you next season to have a nice discussion on CBDCs, right? And specifically wholesale, retail, smart cash and programmable fiat because i think it's a, it's a it's a very fascinating topic and i think i still believe that there is a little bit of a herd mentality going across the world in terms of cbdc's but you know it doesn't care matter what arjun has to say because we don't want facebook to be the first one to launch well that too that that too but having said that let's give them the credit to have created that momentum 100%. And, and, and 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 you know sometimes the first venture everyone forgets Right. And people have already forgotten. Let's be honest, if you hadn't mentioned the word Facebook who, right who now. Who remembers Libra? DM. Libra, Libra, right? Libra. So I, I nearly forgotten the name, right? And there wasn't a day I wasn't reading about Libra because, you know, it was confusing the, the hell out of me when it first started. Carrying on with that discussion, right? In terms of not just technologies, right? You mentioned notes, right? Um, so I'll come clear. I'll make my position very, very clear. Uh, and feel free to please disagree. I don't like the word cashless. I see that as a clickbaity term, which people like to go on to conferences and throw out here and there, right? There's no doubt we're moving to a less cash environment. It's palpable, it's, see, it's viewable, right? But I actually don't think cash goes away anytime soon, right? Very keen to hear your perspective. So it's, uh, especially, you know, I'm still a subsidiary of a central bank. I'm a recovering central banker. I worked for different central banks before. Uh, central banks kind of like cash, right, for all kinds of reasons. Uh, so being completely cashless uh, is probably not working into anybody's uh, benefit. So I think uh, less reliant on cash, having uh, accessibility to people if they don't want to use cash, they have other digital digital methods. But uh, I think, uh, again, what's happening in the world, uh, cash will always be around. Normally, I say, no, as long as uh, there is an income tax, uh, there will always be cash around. Here in the UAE, I don't know where we're going, but, uh, but I think there are, there are very few countries where they will kind of push the cashless agenda just to be maybe uh, one of the unicorns. Okay, we, we got it, right? So when you look at some of the Scandinavian countries and others. Sweden is a great example. Exactly. But it's a very unique, specific exactly. Uh, situation exactly. there. I don't think it's going to be replicatable easily in uh, any other part yeah, of and, the world. Yeah, and it's a very interesting debate. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was on uh, during Jitex and, and, uh, and you know, I was on a panel which was talking about the future and, you know, the vast majority of people were talking cashless, cashless. And I said, yeah, as a trend, I don't disagree with you, but I can give you 10 reasons why cash is required in the market right now. And, and I'll be honest, what I found quite uh, comforting is that uh, one of the GCC sort of national payment infrastructure player actually officially has shifted their tone to using the term less cash. As a matter of fact, they don't use the word cashless anymore. And I think that's quite, quite, quite right because you don't want to disenfranchise a lot of people who find comfort in cash. By the way, no one has yet replaced cash in its finality, right? It, it's, it's there. It has very specific attributes which are very difficult to replicate in the yeah. digital world. One thing I would say, though, and it's not cash, coming from Canada where we always want to make sure that everybody is included, right? So uh, sometimes as payments professionals, we have a tendency to introduce a lot of new 
payments, form factors, like what you were mentioning. And we never actually get rid of anything else. So <laughs> Czechs, for example, you know, yeah. I, I was born in Czechoslovakia, so I'm Czech. So I always get worried when people start Czech. saying, you know, we need to get rid of Czechs because Czech. <laughs> I don't know which ones they are talking about. But uh, in Canada, for example, the government was very hesitant to start sunsetting Czechs because there is still a portion of population which like Czechs. In the UAE, Czechs are a big thing, right? And we actually will be thinking about creating digital equivalent of a check because mm -hmm. as an instrument, it's it's important. In South Africa, during COVID, the government said, okay, that's the end of checks. So COVID basically killed um, killed checks in. So we are generally pretty bad though, removing some of the payments instruments from the market. Well, my, my hypothesis is we will not only see smart checks, if I use the word smart checks. Well, you have well, one here. But. Exactly, but the one without the Z, right? Uh, uh, and But we'll also possibly see smart cash. Right, uh, which which will have some traits or attributes, as you correctly said, which are digital. You've now actually given me the next question, which is the proliferation of form factors. Right, um, there are so many ways now to pay. Right, and it's not just a B two B challenge now; it's actually a consumer mm -hmm. challenge. Right, and more are coming on their way. Right, it's sheer madness. <laughs> Right, because for the vast majority of the world, it's actually defaulting people to what they're most comfortable to. Because you know, when you see chaos, you tend to go to the corner which you are most familiar with. You you become less experimental. Everybody is comfortable with like, yeah. chaos, so they, so, exactly. so so. What is and I'm not mm -hmm. going to put you on the spot and say what's the central bank's perspective on this. So I love innovation, and I'm you know fine, and that's great, but. I think we're just introducing a lot of complication, a lot of complexity into the into the system. How do you see it pan out? That's the 10 million dirham question, right? Um, so um, listen, I, what I usually do to make some meanings out of chaos or difficult things is I try to look at the past because there is a tendency of society to kind of go in circles, right? Just a different flavor. So when you think about diversity of form factor, think about the days and uh, we talk about PayPal and others when they were trying to create these wallets ecosystems, right? And everybody had to, you almost had to put a little bit of money in PayPal and a little bit of money here and, and then you could transact in these environments and that was terrible because you want to keep your money, you know, where your salary comes and where you get some interest and stuff. So opening and interconnecting that you actually don't need to put money into the different wallets, but you uh, you keep it on your bank account. And when you have a need to make a PayPal transaction, PayPal can go and touch your money in a secure way and basically make a payment from uh, or take your money from, from your bank account. So I think and I am working for an intermediary, uh, I think there will not be a winner or loser, right? We have seen Bitcoin, we have seen cryptocurrency. It's not something which will take over the world in my mind. Yeah. I may be wrong. Uh, of course, if there well, is I'm a never, black swan. I'm, I'm not going to buy coffee using Bitcoin. Well, but for other reasons, but any other cryptocurrency, I think it would be very hard, even if it has a stable, more stable value, to um, become the the thing which people want to keep wealth in and use as a mean of exchange or as a transactional currency. So I believe there will be cryptocurrencies. I believe there will be stable coins. I believe there will be CBDCs, retail CBDCs. There will be normal commercial bank money like we have today. You know, Dirham is a digital currency, which is a commercial bank uh, money. Um, what we need to build is an infrastructure which will allow you to bridge all of these worlds, right? There are also other currencies you may not be thinking about, but loyalties, right? We have loyalties here, there, points. I feel that the future of clearing houses or national payment infrastructure is to enable kind of the coexistence of these things. Like, why wouldn't you pay with CBDC uh, and portion of the bill with something else? And we have to make... So I totally agree, right? So, so... So that brings us to the discussion on interoperability, right? So so I, I've just used a word which I, I guess you just defined better than I can, right? Which is the ability to move money across form factors in a seamless manner. My view again is uh, I think intra-country interoperability is still a possibility through having, you know, bridging solutions, right? As long as, you know, exchange rates can fit around what does a, a Ether coin Converts for, to their home at any given run, moment. Any given moment and so on and so forth. Right. I don't think that's beyond the art of possible. I am a little bit more cynical on cross-border, right? 
uh, for a number of reasons. One, you actually just mentioned, you know, geopolitical challenges. Um, secondly, um, um, you know, I had a conversation the other day uh, with with someone who comes from a, a, one of the big stablecoin cross border provider, right? Mm-hmm. And and the gentleman's answer to me was, "Well, we're building stuff on multi chain, right? Uh, so we are ready for interoperability." My question was, "Well, the gas fee kills me." Right. <laughs> and his view was, well, yeah, but that's only a time when we achieve the economies of scale. So I said, so I have to pay you to achieve scale for me to get a benefit that I should get today. Right. And immediately the conversation ended, uh, as you can understand. Right. And I and I was not being smart. I was just giving a very lame person's view because that's the problem. Right. Um I, I, I think this area is going to be very interesting to watch. I think I think I think I completely agree with you. We're going to see proliferation before we see some sort of consolidation. Uh, I do think stable coins definitely have a very good use case going forward, uh, but we need to see the word stable being delivered. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, article or a, or a white paper from uh, uh, Bank of International Settlement, which just mm-hmm. came out last week, uh, which I think the title was "Would the Real." Stable coin, please stand up, which is, I think, a take on the Eminem song. Maybe I've got the title wrong, but it was a very interesting read. And I, I actually enjoy reading these, these, these kinds of stuff. It's interesting that, that you also believe that this uh, uh, proliferation will happen before we actually see some sort of stability or standardization coming. Having said that, I am actually a firm believer that faster payment will get such rapid adoption that it will definitely eat into some of the traditional uh, methods of payments, right? Because it's easy, it's simple to understand, it's instant, right? Uh, And the banks will go along with it largely because it comes as a part of any country's monetary policy, if I may say so, right? And let's be honest, anything which is done by the central banks, you know, uh, central bank, the bank's sort of go ahead with it. Marketing is easier. The convincing is easier. Well, yeah, I, th- I think, you know, some of them can push back and they will and, and so on and so forth. But I think there comes a point. And this is my question with the retail CBDCs also, right? Which is, you know, what role will the banks actually play? I, I personally think you have programmable fiat. Arguably, they still stay. But again, as I said, that's a separate question. That's next season. That's next season. Just uh, on, on the one, one, you mentioned the the interconnectedness or the interledger. I was sitting on the W3C, the World Wide Web Organization. They were trying actually to solve how different blockchains can talk together. Mm -hmm. Uh, It wasn't a trivial solution. Uh, So I'm leaving it to the smart people, you know, at uh, MIT and elsewhere. Um, But you mentioned the faster payments, and I certainly hope that uh, we will see a rapid adoption. And I think we are well positioned to see that. You see instant payments popping now, popping up in every single country. The big challenge in front of us will be to do a cross-border interconnectedness. But you're going to see that. I I, I personally think that'll happen faster because wherever, and this is, I think... it's not trivial either. And it will give you some learnings to how to potentially interconnect the different uh, form factors. So so geopolitics will define a lot of that, let's be honest. So friendly countries will invest that that effort. But, you know, these will be national level agendas. And we're starting to see, right? UPI is connecting with a few others. I've heard, uh, you know, PIX is actually in conversations with people in South... uh, South America, and I don't even know the long and short of it. What's quite interesting is I can see scenarios where a particular country which might get sanctioned by one country will still be able to move money from A to Z through a whole host of connections which would possibly bypass the sanctions because they might have a friendly relationship with two other countries in the in the way and then money actually loses its traceability somewhere through the journey right? Arguably not. Because not every, and and this is the issue with all CBDCs, people by default assume that all CBDCs are going to be based on blockchain. Actually, the the first CBDC which was launched in China is, if I'm not wrong, is on database, right? So so it's it's going to be very interesting. Uh, uh, Again, at the risk of diverting away, uh, I'm cognizant of time. I'm going to come back to the country where you and me are both sitting, which is UAE, right? So I know you alluded to it slightly, but that that you know the payments environment in the UAE uh, is you know you were pleasantly surprised when you arrived here six months ago, right? Uh, what's your view on the state of the nation, as I say, 
across fintech and payments? Well, I, I think the ambition of the country is fantastic, right? So uh, now I think with uh, the ambitious agenda the central bank actually started, the FIT program, um, we are now building uh, blocks which will actually completely energize the 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 UAE being the fintech hub, right? We have a lot of other examples where countries are doing really well. You are going to Singapore to fintech festival. They are doing extremely well. I think with instant payments, the new regulatory regimes, open banking coming in, even doing something like a you know less exciting but still important uh, domestic debit card uh, debit card scheme, which we will be launching. I think the fintechs will grow here. Uh, I think they can test things in this market before they try to do it also in some other parts of the world. We will see some consolidation after, but I think we will really become a growing ground for new innovative innovative things. Okay, so you alluded to a domestic scheme, right? And and domestic debit card scheme, as you as you called it. Uh, actually, it's another product which I think has uh, you know is going to have a significant impact uh, on the market. Uh, um, but before I get into sort of why I think it's going to have significant impact, what was the thinking behind that? So wh why does the UAE, uh, you know, we, we, we're, we're not an unbanked country anymore. We're mm -hmm. possibly underbanked, not from a payments perspective, because even the WPS programs now give people prepaid cards. Now it's a whole different thing. People go the minute after that and go to an ATM machine and pull all the cash out. But I think that's just a, a, a comfort and a confidence thing. So why launch a domestic... Uh, scheme. So it was before my time. So I don't exactly know what were the initial trigger points. I know from other parts of the world where I was, um, there are usually a couple of reasons. And I think uh, similarly in the UAE, one is um, when you start realizing, uh, because digital payments are important for the economy, right? Uh, if tomorrow all points of sale terminals or cards stopped working, the economy effectively stops. We saw it during COVID in South Africa. We had to, you know, lock everybody up. The transactions went down to 20% of the normal uh, volume and uh, the economy effectively stopped. When you start realizing um, that you are dependent on somebody else who can turn the switch at their leisure and turn your economy off effectively, it's a scary thought. Mm -hmm. It's a, again, it's a black swan event, which is very unlikely, but extremely damaging. And that's probably what push is what is pushing currently a lot of uh, countries to start uh, looking at having more sovereign solution where they would be more in control. And it's usually kind of limited in terms of functionality. It should be a simple utility-based ability to pay use point of sales, withdraw money from an ATM. So that's kind of one driver. The other one is, uh, I think there is a pressure on cost of payments, uh, removing friction, removing uh, unnecessary costs. So having kind of a very, very light uh, alternative, uh, which everybody else has to compete with. Uh, if they want to do better, they need to, you know, offer something better. That's another, another reason. So sovereignty, no doubt, uh, being in charge and in control. And second is uh, lowering the cost of acceptance so efficiency and payments. Now, right. So let me play something out in my head. Correct me if I'm wrong. Right. So, so you launch a domestic scheme. Obviously, uh, it comes at a price point which is more attractive because interchange on debit cards uh, in the UAE, I still feel, are formidably high, well, uh, are, are exponentially higher than they should be. Uh, even though we were talking about premium debit cards and the and the and the and the, and the benefits that we provide. My argument uh, is that people who have premium debit cards have credit cards also typically, right? Because, you know, they're in that customer segment. So banks then are obviously encouraged to start launching uh, their d debit cards using the, the scheme. I, I have no idea what you're going to call it, but... Uh, I cannot tell you yet, but it's, it's going to be fine. quite nice. Let's, call it, you, yeah, let's yeah. call it the UAE scheme, right? Let's just call it the UAE scheme, right? Uh, banks aren't happy because... Uh, very large percentage of the interchange income that comes on the back of uh, cards that are issued on other networks, the interchange finds its way back into the issuer, right? Um, but they have no choice because the consumers want it, the retailers or the merchants want it because it's it's better rate and obviously it's something which is promoted by the central, central banks, so therefore there is an element of obligation. That actually has quite a seismic effect on on, on the whole payment landscape because you've literally taken out a lot of, I guess, in my hum, humble opinion, inefficient cash 
out of the system, right? Uh, what sort of reaction are you going to see from the banks? Um, well, uh, as you said, if it's a national agenda, uh, it has to be done. And uh, what I always try to do is, even though, I, yes, I'm close to the regulator, I'm not the central bank, I'm regulated by the central bank, uh, but of course, uh, you know, I have some levers to, levers to pull. But all our products, I would like banks and other financial institutions to see commercial value in. Because if you just push it because of regulation, because of mandate, yes, it's going to launch, but is it going to be as successful as it as it should be? So I still believe that uh, when you think longer term, uh, having something which is a national utility, you have more control about the product roadmap and what will be implemented, uh, you know, on the domestic debit card scheme, because you are basically a one member of that of that scheme. I think there are some long term benefits the banks uh, would be definitely seeing. Um, so far, the reaction has been quite positive. It's more about, okay, what is going to be the spec? How long are you going to give us to reissue the cards? The one thing which I mentioned, the current thinking is that, of course, the cards would be co-batched with uh, one of the uh, other schemes uh, of choosing of the of the issuer of the bank. And that's mainly for international acceptance because a lot of people from UAE, they travel abroad. And while we may try to build you know, certain bilateral arrangements when you travel to India, uh, our card should be accepted and the switches could be interconnected. Generally, you know, we, we need some, uh, some broader acceptance wherever you go. So uh, it will be really, when it's used inside UAE, it will be uh, falling under our scheme. But uh, then when it's used abroad, uh, it's going to... Yeah, be and, and again, you know, I, I shouldn't say this because maybe it's out of turn, but I think there's a lot of learnings from Rupe because I don't think they got everything right. And you don't have to comment on that. I, I personally think there's a lot of learning because I, I think they they, they 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 went really aggressive. I think they disenfranchised the banks to an extent that actually banks weren't wanting to come along willingly. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it's it's I, th I think they're finding a way back. I, I don't think Rupee has been a runaway success. Uh, uh, but you know, the technology it's built on is you know, is, 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 is I very hope it's good. solid is the technology, as you know, we will be using here. Yeah, so. <laughs> no, I, the technology is incredibly useful. I think it was more of a pricing uh, a mechanism where I think, you know, a, a certain agenda overtook the whole thinking around it. Let's come to open finance. And it just uh, on the interchange, I just want to mention one thing. So, of course, the interchange is regulated by the central bank. Currently, we have a ceiling. I think there will be a pressure to continue lower the the maximum interchange, which can be interchange, which can be uh, charged. I have to say, you know, I uh, I'm not a big fan of interchange, but I also believe uh, it cannot be zero, right? You have to strike the right balance, and not it's not a trivial exercise to realize, you know, okay, how much of the money from the merchant acquirer should be actually passed to the issuer for all the work they are they are doing. So having the right balance is quite important. Euro probably pushed it a little bit too far, uh, but I think with uh, with in UAE, we are trying to strike the right. Um, the and I think you, if, I, if I may take on that discussion, you know, uh, 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 so again, I wear my, my retail hat for a while. It's been a while. You know, I, I always looked at interchange for credit cards and interchange for debit cards in a very different lens. I always said, please don't apply the same lens, right? The credit cards inherently, A, the level of adoption is lesser right because it's not a universal product you have to qualify mm -hmm. here you, you know if you open a bank account which everyone must you should get a debit card secondly you know uh, most uh, uh, credit cards in this part of the world similar to the us are very rich on the reward points mm -hmm. right and i think a large percentage of that interchange income goes towards it you also have delinquencies on credit cards so so you know my my bigger issue on the credit card has always been apr Mm -hmm. Right. Which, I, you know, 38, 39, 40 percent in this country, I've always felt that, whoa, right. It's 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 predatory. But in any case, your bill. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's it. And, and you know, so you have and, you know, I don't want to quote numbers here and it's not a discussion worth having because I, I don't want to get, you know, all the flack I get from all my banking friends, which is, you know, a, a very, very high percentage of this country actually revolves. Right. It's not only this country, you know. My wife was running a portfolio in the in the U.S. So yeah, well, well, the U.S. You know, U.S. just hit a trillion dollars two weeks ago. A trillion dollars, first time in its history, in outstanding debt. Uh, I I read this morning. I think the Fed, uh, New York Fed, actually just issued a report. The cumulative uh, household debt is just hitting new levels. Mortgages, auto loans, credit cards, and others. Every category is rising, 
right? Delinquencies on credit cards are sitting at 9%, which is kind of like a high in, a, in a quite a lot of while, right? I think the last time you had to go back eight or nine or 10 years to see that level of sort of uh, numbers. But, but I, I personally think interchange will drive things down. I don't think it should be zero uh, uh, or near zero also, because I think you need that money to flow through the system so that innovation can happen. And then on that innovation thing, right? So we're obviously moving in the UAE towards the open finance uh, agenda. Uh, why I get excited about open finance, although I'm still waiting for some country to have really cracked it, and maybe you'll Brazil tell me. Brazil is doing uh, Brazil is doing well? Okay. Look into Brazil. Yeah. yeah. It, it, in my view, open finance, coupled with the fact that you have solid public infrastructure, is a great playing field for fintech innovation to actually happen, right? So rather than playing the inefficiency arbitrage, you start actually genuinely building products on top of what actually exists. Correct. What's your view on it? Well, I'm a big fan of uh, open banking, open payments, open finance. Um, you have to pace yourself also because the market has to be uh, ready for it, right? Uh, when you start uh, leveling the playing field. People have to be able to consume data in real time, start offering you things. But generally, I think this is a great benefit for the uh, end user, for the consumers at the end. I also feel that the banks, uh, uh, and we saw it around the world, can find quite the valuable business models, right? Because today we are loyal, right? And that's maybe one example. I have a 17-year-old kid. Um, I am loyal to a brand, right? So, of course, I go to my bank because I think they know me, they know I'm a good customer, and I try to get services from that bank. Technically, the bank only knows about me, my transactions, <laughs> how much money I have. So if they are you know, sharing that information, somebody else can have exactly the same uh, the same understanding of myself. I see my son as the new generation. They are coming with a completely different approach, right? Even when I order pizza, I go to have my favorite pizza shop and I order it from there. Him, he wants a cheese pizza. He doesn't care if it came from this pizza or that pizza. He wants it fast and he wants it cheap, ideally while he's online gaming, right? So I'm not saying that opening bank accounts and getting loans will be like ordering pizza, but that's what I see the future. You are somewhere, you want to do something, you need a loan to go to Europe, uh, you need uh, travel insurance. Put it out there, make all the properly licensed institution to know the same level of information about you and pick the best deal uh, somebody is willing to offer you. So that's kind of the long-term view. In the short term, any app, if you used it, um, it's actually an open banking app, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because we are a third party provider, which initiate payments. Call, we show you how much you have on the account. We show you some transaction history limited to Ani only. Um, so we have the APIs as part of Ani. So you can imagine that as part of the open finance, the opening of payments may be the first, uh, first step, then sharing more information and then stepping into some of the insurance use cases and stuff like that. So, so I, 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 everything you just said is like music to my ear. You're, uh, that, that's kind of what I, I think should be heading. Here's the dampener, right? Okay. Um, record profits from banks in this part of the world, right? Um, some could argue that they are two and a half times more profitable than other markets, right? Obviously, we don't have the scale of some of the other banks globally, mm -hmm. but just talking profitability. Mm -hmm. There is practically no incentive to change, right? Uh, they are innovating. I, as a matter of fact, I give banks a lot of credit for what I call small innovations, right? So we've gone from the world of, you know, uh, cash and check at a teller to ATM machines, to mobile apps, to, you know, now integrating Ani, to- well, Passwordless, to, just uh, password taking less, selfies. selfies. Like those are- Pretty amazing no, no, so I give them a lot of credit. As a matter of fact, again, on a, one of the panels very recently, I went up against some of the fintechs and I said, stop beating the banks. They're highly regulated, right? They are at the end of the day, the custodians of people's money. You can't expect them to, you know, be going left, right and center, just innovating for the sake of innovating. So there has been lots and lots of what I call relatively small innovations along the journey, incrementally, it's very different. And I know that because, you know, I've been banking for 20 years of my life and I know exactly what my first bank account looked and felt like compared to what it does this morning. Yeah. And I think it's a seismic shift if I just, you know, take a take a step back. My, my fear here is 
where is the incentive for open banking and open finance going to come for the banks and predominantly the bigger banks who actually control the vast majority of the banks, uh, vast majority of the of the customers, right? Yeah. Uh, Will it again come back to the regulator coming and saying, you better do it, mm -hmm. right? Because I can't see it any other way. So th that's probably for another episode. Um, but uh, we are working on a model where we believe it can hit ideally both sides. So there will always be a mandatory set of APIs where, you know, you mm. should provide, it's, it's your information, it's your you as a customer, you know, you... you we will be likely mandating the banks to share this. Um, but uh, if you start abusing that, or if you are a business which wants to call on that, you know, to offer different things, there are some premium APIs which the banks should be allowed to charge for, for mm -hmm. example. So we are trying to create like stacks of open APIs, and some of them, of course, I think should be free. Some of them, on the other hand, uh, need to be commercially viable. And uh, again, if somebody as the third party is benefiting into their business model and bank is providing this data and it's beyond the normal consumer benefit, yeah, I think they should be able to commercialize it and make some uh, make some money out of it. Well, I, but I, each bank will have to decide where they want to live in the value chain, right? And I saw it again in South Africa, for example. Uh, some banks they are comfortable to be the platform bank, which means you know I they like that there will be multiple channels which will be bringing banking services to the market. Some other banks they say no, I don't want anyone to sit between my customer and myself. I want to own it all, and they have this concept that the banking app will become a super app where you're gonna be chatting with your friends. I wish them luck because I don't think that's the model. Um, but uh, imagine that you know you have reached to everybody on Botim or everybody on WhatsApp, and you can start marketing uh, your banking products. It probably opens some uh, opens some no, new business models. I, you know, I, models. I, I, I personally think you, you are going to see all three models emerge. I think you're going to see the erstwhile large banks who will basically say, we're banks, we'll have an app, not a super app, we'll have an app and we'll give customers the entire experience that they need. And, and as long as we can also pull third-party APIs, we'll try and give that experience through our products and services. The front end can be a bit more open. I do think some of the the mid-sized players might go down the Tinkoff model, which is the super app, which is a bank-powered super app. Uh, but they'll have to collaborate with non-banking partners, and you know we call it beyond banking. You know we consultants come up with the word for something or the other again. Uh, and and I think there will be banks, which are the smaller banks, who will want to become these platform banks or banking as a service players because pretty much that's the only way they can scale. Right. Yeah, and don't don't underestimate that we still have a financial inclusion challenge here. I think I mentioned you it do. at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, there is half of population here, which is still making decent money. They still need to coexist here and uh, you know be financially included. I think uh, there will be emerging financial institutions trying to tailor specific products uh, for. And for I think that should be across the across the band. I, I I do think we will see some community banks coming up, right? Uh, from what I've heard is, you know, there is one already, there's been a license issued uh, to another one, there's one more license in the making. And I think these community banks will operate uh, arguably, obviously, you know, at lower capital levels, they're not going to be necessarily wanting to drive the same level of, of return on investment as some of the others, because I think the or whole mentality, credit and stuff. you know, flat credit will be quite different. One last question, Jan, I'm conscious it's Friday evening and you were, you'd rather be sitting with your family than me. Um, um, no, I kind of like you now. No, well, <laughs> you're pretty much the exception to the rule, by the way, <laughs> right? Uh, don't worry, it'll be a nice question. It's okay. the last one. We didn't talk much about B2B payments, right? Your closing thoughts, uh, you can wear a practitioner's hat, you can wear the Al Etihad uh, uh, payments hat, whichever hat. It's an area which is very close to heart. It's mm -hmm. an area which I think can do with a lot more attention. Um, you know, if you see the global B2B versus B2C, it's, you know, about 24 trillion here, 120 trillion there, you know, 5% of it's it. It's where the, yeah, it's, where, it's, you know, yeah. it's where the opportunity lies. We don't see as much innovation, so on and so forth. W what do you see, firstly, are you guys in Al-Atihad planning something in that field? And how do you see, maybe you can't share it, but you know, uh, where do you see B2B payments heading in this part of the world? Where do you see the disruption happening? So um, 
I, I appreciate that not every single payment has to be real time, especially in the B2B, because there are a lot of things which you can kind of plan. And uh, But I feel that even the B2B payments will be moving into the more real time space. People don't want to, you know, to send money two days in advance to kind of uh, hope that it's going to appear on the other side. So one thing which we have done, and it's not as sexy to market, but Ani has another component which we went live with, and that's called Ani Core. And that's a typical IBAN to IBAN ISO 20022 data rich payment trail. And many of the banks who are currently live, they are actually building new value propositions for their business customers just on that straight through processing, uh, passing, you know, invoices and stuff like that. So it's there. It's an core. We don't talk about it because it's really for specific use cases uh, for the business to business payments. But I think we are, again, one of the few countries which is completely live on a real time ISO 20022, fully data rich, IBAN. It can be using pens as credit cards if you, if you want. And uh, that's something we cannot uh, we cannot forget, right? The consumer part is the innovative, fancy, beautiful on your phone. But most payments happen business to business, finance. You know, the value chain of um, of uh, it's important to make it also real time and carry the information throughout. And it has an exponential chain. impact in creating value for the economy, right? Because that's where predominantly the economy. And I think sits. that's something we also want to start sharing and maybe, uh, you know, kind of making it a little bit more known that uh, these components of ANI are there as well for the B2B payment. Excellent. Jan, thank you for coming. Thank you for um, having me. Congratulations on ANI. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm super excited for whatever I can do. I'll be the, I'll, I'll be my, your small flag. Send bearer. more payments, send more payments. Yeah, no, I, no, you know, well, I don't, I, I don't I, make I money. Wish, on... I wish I earned enough to send more payments, but whatever payments I can send, I will send. As I told you before we started, I actually had three people download. Thank you. Uh, uh, ANI I don't charge on, for the on, downloads on, or anything else. Yeah. It's only when the payment succeeds. That's yeah. the only thing I make. So money. no, they, they did because I told them, I said, I'm only going to spend payments through your, your phone because I don't have the time to go and drag your IBAN, drag my IBAN. Nothing wrong with it. IBAN was a great, you know, yet another innovation, I think, which was very good. Uh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll reach out to you again. Hopefully you'll answer my phone uh, and we'll have more Too chats. Far, so um, and, and what I would like to do is actually uh, yesterday we just published a paper on embedded payments and we took a slightly different perspective, which was around uh, it's great, but just be cognizant of some of the downsides. Okay. Right. Um, I will send that to you. I'd be very, very keen to hear your views. Uh, it's more of an opinion paper rather than a, a, a data-led paper because I think we. it was more of an educational piece to say, mm -hmm. you know, people get so excited about embedded payments. It is the poster child of embedded finance so far. Well, BNPL maybe too. Um, but we'll send it across to you. Thank you Thank for coming. Thank you so much. And we always a pleasure. See, yeah, and we, you know, you. maybe in twelve months' time, maybe before, we'd love to sort of bring you back and hear about you know where Ani is, and then maybe get into some numbers and ask you for some statistics. Yeah, we and are so bigger so than so pigs. Well, you know, I, I, it's all relative, isn't it? It's, it's relative to the size of the economy and the in the and the people who live in it. But uh, you know, hats off to it, and best of luck with the uh, domestic uh, domestic scheme that which you I think you're, you're collaborating with NPCI on that. Um, with that. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, I want to say uh, goodbye, good night, and have a good weekend. Uh, that was Jan Pilbor. He's CEO of Alet Yahad Payments, which is a subsidiary of the Central Bank. It was quite refreshing because I think he's, 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 he's a candid guy, so you could actually have a proper conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And like all my episodes, I walk out of the room having learned a few new things. Um, so from a selfish perspective, thank you to Jan. With that, goodbye, and uh, we'll see you next week. 